my favorite thing in the world to teach. I've taught a lot of marine science classes. My favorite thing to teach is anatomy. Okay, so just kind of keep your options open, and it's been a really good career path for me. It also gets me working with lots of different people. Are y'all good? Okay, so um, what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be linking together um, decorating, grooming, and morphology, and I've color idiot proofed it, color coded it for you. Is that decorating is going to be orange, grooming is going to be green, and morphology is going to be blue. And so what I mean by this is that spider crabs that um, they have a face and they have um, eyes. They're a decapod. They have ten. And they decorate themselves, which means they take materials from the environment and they place it on their backs. We know that they also groom. They clean themselves. Everybody cleans themselves. I've seen about five people grooming themselves just as y'all walked in. And so um, the other thing I'm going to be looking at is morphology, which means what structures do these animals have that allow them to clean themselves efficiently. So I'm going to kind of be linking these guys together. So some acknowledgments. Um, my work is supported by two departments, of course, at the university. And then there are two faculty members in the Department of Biology, Dr. Rice and Dr. Price, who um, were my advisors when I was a student there, but they ended up being my colleagues now, and they're absolutely wonderful. And then I've had some assistance from undergraduates, um, my husband and my son, and then um, other students, right? And then also there are several people that are kind of from this area, um, Charles Crawford and Laura Wiggins, that have actually helped me um, rather collect spider crabs or give me some preserved specimens. So my outline is I'm going to give you all some background again, color coding, and then I'm going to talk about spider crabs, and then I'm going to talk about three big studies that I've done. And how I'm going to address this is I'm going to give you all the problem, objectives, hypotheses, results, conclusions for decorating, and then I'm going to go back and do problems, objectives, hypotheses for grooming and et cetera. So I'm going to kind of break it down, and then I'll kind of give you the big picture take home so you all can tell the people that are not here what they're supposed to write their papers on. <laughs> so what I'm going to go into now is um, background theory. And so I'm going to talk about camouflage. So first of all, we know that animals and even humans, as seen in this picture with the human with the ghillie suit, they camouflage themselves to conceal their identity, right? We know that as seen in this arachnid, they also match their background. We know that what this does, theoretically, is it helps them avoid predation like we see in the flounderfish, hide from prey as seen in the snake, and all of these are survival behaviors. But if you notice that all of these are matching their background, okay? There is another idea that's something that's called disruptive coloration, which is a camouflage strategy. And what disruptive coloration means is that it conceals their body shape. So we can tell that this is a tiger, but making out its legs, its head, its tail, and everything is very difficult. The same thing for this insect is that they have different shapes, different colors, different sizes that are going to help break up their body outline. As seen in this fish, we know that this fish has lighter on the bottom, darker on the top. It also has some line and some patches that help break up the outline of the fish. And then we know that we see this in cephalopods and also um, scorpion fish, and it's a type of camouflaging strategy. They don't necessarily have to break up, um, they necessarily don't have to match their environment. So now into some background theory on grooming is that grooming is considered to be secondary. So for example, y'all are not going to be cleaning yourselves if y'all are going to be being chased by a predator, okay? So grooming is going to be secondary, and it's only going to occur when primary behaviors are absent. So feeding, mating, habitat maintenance, those are all considered to be primary. And we see that grooming behaviors occur all the time. I mean, think about how much time we spend a day, whether it's scratching ourselves, you know, brushing our hair, getting a shower, that sort of thing, how much time we spend a day. And it's been documented in many different groups of animals that animals can spend 25% of the day or six hours a day up to grooming their bodies, right? And we see this in birds preening their feathers. We also see this in shrimp, you know, actually groom other animals and help clean other animals. And then we see our wonderful cats and then ourselves groom daily. So it's something that has been documented in pretty much every animal. So some background. The video that's going to be playing is a freshwater shrimp. And this freshwater shrimp is going crazy with grooming, okay? And so what is grooming? Grooming, you can clean your outside of your body. Sometimes you can even clean the inside of your body, like when y'all brush your teeth, for example. And we know that it's been proposed in the literature to be secondary, but there really haven't been any tests done to actually say, oh, yeah, it definitely is secondary. But it, we can see how it's probably not going to be as important as, like, fighting and mating. 
And we know also that it takes up a large, a large portion of the individual's time budget. When I say a time budget, we know that in a 24-hour period, you only have so much time to study for tests, so much time to eat. And then with some of y'all, grooming may, may put secondary and you may not be getting showered, right? So the deal is, is that this has been documented many times in crustaceans. And Dr. Bauer at the University of Louisiana has been studying um, grooming behaviors on crustaceans for like 30 years. And what we're seeing in this poor busy shrimp here, that he's using his P1, which are his first walking legs, which are chelate, and they're grooming their mouth parts. They're grooming um, the other pincher, right? We know that shrimp can actually go inside and clean their gills and clean their walking legs. So what does grooming actually do? We know that it actually does remove things. It removes epizootic animals. We know it removes microbes. It removes sedimentation. It removes algae, right? And so it is actually an anti-fouling mechanism. The problem is with crustaceans is that crustaceans that you all know mostly that they molt, which means they're going to shed their exoskeleton. So when they shed their exoskeleton, what happens is that anything that's on their back goes bye-bye. It leaves, right? So it is kind of a grooming um, period. The problem is, is that between molt one and molt two, there's that intermolt period. And at that time, the animal can get heavily fouled. And the thing that's really crazy with crustaceans is that some crustaceans have a terminal molt. A terminal molt is when an animal stops molting, okay? This usually happens later on in the animal's life, but you can imagine if that crab stops molting, it's going to get fouled really easily unless it cleans itself. And so why groom? It helps keep you streamlined for motion. We know crustaceans are arthropods, so they have lots of jointed appendages to make sure that they can move. We know it helps keep your gills clean so you have efficient oxygen respiration. And we know also for sensory reception. If I have these antennae that sense chemicals in the water, I need to make sure that they stay clean. So how do we know that grooming works? Um, Dr. Bauer has done some experiments. This one is probably the easiest one to explain, is that these are crayfish gills. And in this situation right here, this crayfish had his grooming appendages intact. And we can see the individual gill filaments, they're unbelievably clean. Okay, what happened was that when you remove the grooming appendages from crayfish, this is what the gills look like. They become completely impacted with sediment, right? And we can see how this poor crayfish, you know, his respiration and his gills is going to be severely decreased. So what do crustaceans usually do? It's kind of predictable. They normally groom their respiratory structures and they groom their primary sensory structures like their eyes and their antennae, for example. So a typical decapod, you know, the eyes are going to be up front, they're going to have two pairs of antennae, and their gills are usually somewhat internal. So in morphology, this is easy for y'all, that we would expect that most of our morphological characteristics probably have a function, and they probably have a function that benefits us just through natural selection. So for example, eyelashes. Eyelashes are beneficial because they help um, prote protect your eyes and prevent materials from entering your eyes. We know that fingernails are tools, and they help us dig. Our thumb is a morphological characteristic, right? And it helps us write and grasp things. And then we know, um, kind of going into cellular levels, is that we have keratin, which is a protein, on our skin. And the deal is what this protein is, and this, is, um, what this would be the outside environment. This is keratin. This is your epithelial tissue. What this keratin does, it helps keeps us waterproof, right? And it also provides us um, with some protection against friction. So we see every day that we have specific morphological structures, and these structures have functions. So when we get to gills, and we get to crustaceans specifically, Crustaceans have gills that have all these filaments on them. And when you take a cross section through one of these, you can see they have an incredibly high surface area for respiration. We know that um, most crustaceans, they have pinchers. And you can see when we look at the morphology of these pinchers that they have a very pointed end. We know that helps picking things up. We know that they have tufts of CD for sensory reception. And then they also we also know they have CD that helps to say, hey, here I am, come mate with me. We know that crustacean on their antennae, they have um, different structures and different types of CD for sensory reception. And then we also know that some crustaceans have these really weird areas that have nothing but a whole bunch of CD. And through studies that we know that these types of CD, when there's so much of it occurring, it's for sensory reception and then also displaying like I talked about. So if we kind of talk about, so that's kind of our background. 
And so if we talk about spider crabs, for example, this is Labinia dubia. It's a common spider crab that's found in the Gulf of Mexico. It's also found all the way up the Atlantic coast. And what we know about this guy is that he uses materials from the environment to decorate. They'll attach anything from their environment, and they have these very special CDs on the back that if you look at it through um, a scanning electron microscope, it looks just like Velcro. You put a picture of Velcro up with a picture of these CDs, they look identical. You can't tell the difference, okay? And what they do is that they take these materials from the environment, and they attach it, and they can unattach it as well. However, it's been proposed that these crabs are only select materials from the environment that are going to help them match, that they're going to actually um, camouflage their bodies by mashing, okay? What my hypothesis is, is that I think it's disruptive col um, coloration, is that I think that they attach these materials and what it does is it breaks up their body outline that this really doesn't look so much like a crab, okay? And so why do crabs um, decorate themselves? It, decoration is also called masking, and if you think about it, a crab can't just grow, right? A crab has got to be one size, molt, grow. Be one size, molt, grow. So their growth and their color changes are very periodic. They can't change them from day to day. So what decorating does, it allows them to change what they look like, okay? So if they move to a different environment, they can change what they look like a lot easier. So in this bottom picture right here, this is a spider crab that has um, decorated themselves with sponges. This is another crab, spider crab, that's decorated themselves with anemones, right? And again, they can remove these guys. And what we know is that you can actually see some of the seeds. This is just a picture I took with my iPhone, so nothing really special. You can see all these tufts of seedy that occur on the rostrum area of this crab that's used for decoration. And how this stuff works, this is actually a, clearly a crab trap. And if you look in this, it has a ton of algae, and these crabs just look like a big tuft of algae in it, right? And so what's important is to know the visual capabilities of these crabs. I mean, can they see color? Can they tell if materials are going to match their environment? And what the research shows is, yes, they can see color. They can see from the, around the 400 um, nanometer wavelength up to about 600, so they can see color. And so we know that they attach materials from their environment by attaching them to CD. And we also know that these guys have a terminal molt. So they're going to get to be a certain size, and they're not going to be able to grow anymore. They're not going to be able to shed all that stuff that attaches to their carapace. So there's kind of an idea out there that do they groom these CD to keep them clean, right? Because they need them for a camouflaging strategy. So what happens to these large individuals when they get to this terminal molt? So kind of differences in behaviors between large and small individuals. So now I'm going to go into talking about decorating, right, and the um, research that I've done with decorating. And so the problem is, is that we don't know if crabs select materials from their environment that match or if they're just selecting anything basically that's in their environment. And so are they matching or are they just selecting anything so they don't look like a crab, okay? And I'm also interested to see if males and females and different sized individuals um, behave the same way. And so my first hypothesis is that crabs, you would guess, that's what everybody's predicting, that their crabs are going to select materials that match their environment. So if you put crabs in a natural environment and you give them a choice, they should only select materials that match. The other thing is I'm predicting that large and small individuals should decorate the same because they're going to have predators, right? We all know that, y'all know, a spider crab's biggest size that we collect in the bay is only this big, roughly. We know that there's fish that I've heard y'all talking about that can easily eat that crab, right? So it's not like we're talking about these big, huge spider crabs that wouldn't have any natural predators. And then also, how do males and females behave? And so kind of into some methods, what I would do is I went out in the bay and collected 216 of these individuals, took dorsal shots of them, took them into a program called um, ImageJ, which allows me to calculate their surface area of their entire body. And then also I was able to outline you know, all their different decorations to get what type of decorations they're actually using. And that was kind of a field study. And then what I did in the lab was I gave spider crabs and I used them um, 180 individuals. And what I did is I gave them different treatments. And I only used a crab once in a treatment. And what I did is that I have six treatments. So in this one, the environment was natural. And I gave them only natural um, decorations to select from. This one was a natural environment, bright colored only materials to select from. 
this was a natural environment and they had both natural and brightly colored and just to tell you there was the same number of decorations in each study so for example if I gave them 10 here there would be five natural five colored in this one is everybody good and then um, conversely the opposite with these um, this treatment and so some results they selected anything y'all can see that this stuff is not natural okay but they selected it and this material was replicating seaweed that's found in the bay it was the same weight it was the same density as seaweed and they selected it just as much if we look at it as but what we can see from these pictures is that where are they decorating they're decorating around their movable parts their eyes their antennae and then their first pinchers. so we can see they're decorating all in their front of their body right and so remember that we would predict that large and small individuals would decorate the same. And what we can see here with a very significant p-value, this is carapace length, this is the total percent cover of decorations, and we can see that there's a negative relationship, that as individuals get larger, they decorate less, and that's from the field, and the same thing happened in the lab. So kind of my hypothesis was not accepted because smaller individuals actually decorated their bodies more than larger individuals, and that was for the field and the lab. So now looking at males and females. So I have location, lab versus field, percent body cover of decoration, girls are in pink, boys are in blue, and we can see with a p-value of over 0.05 on both of them that males and females decorate equally. So that hypothesis was predict, um, accepted. So the deal is that makes sense. Large and small individuals, when you go out and collect them in the field, they're in the same habitat. So you would expect um, males and females to kind of decorate the same. So now when I get to actually the experimental design. So what we predict is a given comparison between these two treatments, I would predict if these animals are selecting materials that match their environment, I would predict that treatment one would have more decorations than treatment four. These guys match, these guys do not. Are y'all following me okay? And the same versus five versus um, two. I would predict more decorations in five than in two. And treatment three, I would predict that they would select more natural environments, natural materials to decorate with. And treatment six, I would predict that they would have more colored. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the research on the data from treatment, comparing treatments one versus four. What I found with a p-value of greater than 0.05, there was no significant difference between the number of decorations that the crabs selected and treatments one versus four. So there was no evidence for color matching from this um, comparison. So now I'm going to compare 2 and 5. Again, a p-value greater than 0.04. There is no statistical evidence of color matching for treatments um, 2 and 5. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to um, comparing these guys, right? And what we would predict in treatment 3 is that they should have predicted, they should have selected more natural colorations than they did um, color decorations. And with a p-value, again, of greater than 0.05, there was no difference. So there's no evidence for color matching on this one. When I go to treatment 6, there was a p-value of um, less than um, 0.05, so it does say that there was evidence of color matching, that these individuals did select colored materials more than they did um, natural environments. So in this one, they predict, they behave like we would predict. Overall, um, there was no evidence for color matching here. There was for treatment 6. But if we kind of look at all four um, statistical tests that we did, right, we can see that three out of four tests, there was no evidence for color matching. So I'm not going to accept the hypothesis um, that they select materials that match their environment. But what we did see is that there was a stepwise wide trend. And the stepwide trend was that give them more different materials, they're going to decorate more. This slide always gets stuck. So what happens here is that you can see that there's a stepwise trend. At treatments three and six, always had the most decorations. So what my kind of conclusion is on this one is that they're not selecting materials that match their environment. Instead, they're just picking up everything and they're putting it on their backs. And it, when I say their backs, I'm talking their carapace. And I think that they're doing it not to appear like a crab. So they're doing it as a form of disruptive camouflage. So my conclusions, guys, and this is where I need y'all cell phones, okay? Get out your cell phones, and this is the deal. Instead of typing in, you know, like, dad home or whatever, what, and I don't see y'all having your cell phones in your hand. What is the holdup here? 
Are we all good? Okay, so what y'all are doing, the phone number is going to be this. And you're going to use this phone number for the rest of the time that I'm here. And you're going to type in this phone number. Yes, I know it's only a five-digit code. Okay, and then what you're doing is that whatever answer you have here, so this is your hypothesis, and this is going to be accepted, failed to reject, this is not accepted. The deal is for the message, instead of saying, hi, I'm on my way home, you're going to type in this number. Is everybody understanding what you're doing? This is the phone number. This is your message. You're not going to type in accepted. You're going to type in the number. Is everybody good with me? Then you're just going to hit send. Are y'all good? I'm a little nervous. And so what this is, this is just like instant polling, guys, okay? So crowds will select um, materials that match their environment. Just to show y'all how this works, this is um, a free software program that y'all can use in any of your classes. It's poll everywhere, and you can see the number of people responding is here. And so I kind of have, like, maybe some people maybe not listening very well. Um, <laughs> so the deal is, is that crowds will select materials that match their environment. I am not accepting that, okay? So we can see how y'all turn out. So I'm not accepting that because out of 75% of the time, they did not. So now y'all have another one. The same code, but I need y'all to type in the different message. Y'all are doing better on this one. <laughs> Okay, y'all even are participating more on this one as well. And so the deal is large and small individuals created um, equally. That was definitely um, not accepted because small individuals actually decorated more, right? And so that one was not accepted. So this is your last one for this study, okay? So males and females decorated equally. this one did you do it like within a size class like were all the males and females the same size for males and females I checked to see if there was a difference between size there was no difference in males and females um, with size but they all um, even when I took size out or even added size into the statistics it didn't matter they decorated mm -hmm. the same so this hypothesis was accepted that males and females did decorate equally so in terms of evidence for disruptive camouflage I don't think that they, well, the statistics show that for the most part they didn't select materials that matched 